In 1988, author Salman Rushdie was planning to buy a place in his native India with the advances of his new novel. But that novel, The Satanic Verses, would famously change his life. India became the first country in the world to ban his book, and in Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa calling for his execution. This past April, after 12 and a half years in exile, he returned to his homeland. He recounts his highly emotional journey back to India in the upcoming issue of The New Yorker magazine. I am pleased to have him back on this broadcast where we talked about this idea uh, before it became a reality. Welcome back. Thanks. Nice um, why now? And, and, and tell me about what you went through in finally doing this. Well, for a long time, they wouldn't give me a visa. I mean, that was, you know, because I mean, although I was born with an Indian citizenship, I mean, I became a British citizen a very long time ago. And nowadays, British citizens need visas to go to India, and that was something they wouldn't give me. And then, well, I guess, you know, when things began to change back to normal after the Iranians withdrew the threats and so on a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I got given a visa, and, and, uh, and because I'm of Indian origin, I get a very long visa. I get a five-year visa, which everybody else said you get six-month visas. Yeah. So it's a bit of privilege. <laughs> right. And I was just trying to find a good reason to go. And, and uh, it ended up being two things. One was that there was a literary prize that I was shortlisted for, which right. in the end I didn't get, right. but I went. But the main thing was that when I told my, my older son, who's now just about 21, that I was thinking of going, he immediately said, oh, can I come with you? And at that point, I thought, well, that's the reason for going, to, to, to take him. He hadn't been since he was a kid, and I'd be able to show him yeah. around. And well, that's, essentially, that's what the piece in The New Yorker is about, yeah. is in a sense you're showing him. Showing Zafar around and just letting him rediscover the country as, at the same time as I'm rediscovering it. Just in passing, why did you need a reason to go back? I mean, it would seem to me this is your... Homeland. Well, well, you know, yeah, but it's you don't after, need a prize well, or a no, no, possible no, prize no. or no. But what had happened was so difficult, you know, and there'd been so much noise and confusion and anger and this and that that I always knew that the first trip back would be the tricky one, you know, uh, because it would be inevitably very, very high profile. It would, you know, anything that was any anybody who wanted to go on being you know, having the argument would have it then. You know, the second time Rushdie shows up again, that's not a story. You know, every, every time I go, it's less of a story. But the yeah. first time, there was no way that it was not going to be noisy. So I felt it just needed a little orchestration. Tell me about the emotional impact. Well, you know, India is a kind of country which always smacks you in the face when you show up. I mean, even if you go all the time. So, so why is that? Because I haven't been and everybody tells me that you will come away with an experience unlike others. Well, it's a very extreme country. You know, it's extre it's, it's and it's extremely uh, sensual. It, it's very it's very hot. It's very smelly. It's very noisy. Yeah. Um, everything happens in a very extreme form, uh, especially to people who are not used to, you know, tropical life. Right. And so you arrive, and it's an assault on all your senses. And that and it's it's like that even if you go every few months. So if you go after twelve years, that assault has an enormous impact on you. And having your son with you? Yeah, that was great because then I was able to also see it through his eyes, you know, see what he was seeing and how he was beginning to get in touch with that half of himself because his mother was English. But, but, you know, and so he's spent most of his life in the West. And this was his beginning to make his own relationship with the place. Mm. Is your heart there or not? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I was born there, I was brought up there. Uh, you don't lose that stuff. It's uh, it's always you can see from you know, the books I've written, even in those twelve years when I wasn't going there. You know, they all have to do with India in some way or other. Yeah. What was his most surprising reaction? Well, he thought the Taj Mahal was too small. <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> yeah, that's right. He was, I think, quite disappointed. Did he get up, get to get up early to see it at sunset, at sunrise? Uh, no, we at the other end of the day. We saw it at the yeah. at the end of the day, which is also very beautiful. But but. Um, he just, I think he really was taken aback. He was expecting something on a very grand scale. And the, the, the Taj is a beautiful little miniature. People really, is, is that a common reaction? I don't know. You know. The thing about the Taj that I've found is that it's one of the few buildings in the world which surpasses all the images that have been made of it. You know, it's like you've, you've seen the Mona Lisa a thousand million times before you actually see the, the Mona Lisa. And actually, in that case, the real picture is a little disappointing. Yeah. Uh, with the Taj, you've seen it on chocolate boxes, you know, and tea towels and everything you can imagine. But when you actually see the building, it is more beautiful than you think it's And what is that? What, why is that? 
It's just it, the proportions of it are incredibly beautiful. The marble is incredibly um, lucent, you know, and um, it just has the most extraordinary quality. How about the place of women? Well, you know, in, again, in India, there are terrible still imbalances in 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 uh, what is what is possible for men and women, but. As against that, you know, I mean, one of the things people have always been surprised about in my books is that the women have always been extremely assertive, powerful, forthcoming, noisy, you know, not at all the typical... They've had some role models. Yeah, they have. <laughs> they all, that's, that's my experience of women in India, that they yeah. really are not all, by any means, the kind of modest, recessive, demure stereotype that people have, you know. There's no doubt that there are things that it's very difficult for women. I mean, that there's, you know, if you, even if you look at the level of basic hygiene, you know, that, that yeah. the fact that there aren't proper toilet facilities in India means that men go out and, you know, have to relieve themselves in public, you know, like by the railway track, etc., in the villages I'm talking about. Women, there are strong taboos against that, and actually women have to control their movements, you know, until it's dark. Yes. I mean, that's an amazing thing to think that millions and millions, I mean, tens of millions of women... Are waiting until it's dark. ...have to wait until it's dark every day of their lives because the country hasn't... This country, which has a nuclear bomb, can't provide well, toilets. I wanted to get to that. What, is there much talk about the nuclear bomb and is there much talk about the tension with Pakistan and is there much fear that somehow this thing could well, you know, fall off more. the table into an atomic exchange? Well, there was actually less talk about the bomb than I'd expected. Um, uh, perhaps it's just going through a period when people aren't talking. There's a lot of worry about Pakistan. There always is. Myself, I don't think that anybody thought seriously that there was going to be a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, just because, the, you know, they have a thousand-mile common frontier, and what happens if the wind's blowing in the wrong direction? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's a, you know, so there is that, which is a powerful deterrent to a nuclear exchange. Yeah. Uh, but there's no doubt that the relations between India and Pakistan uh, are not good now. And since the military coup in Pakistan, they have deteriorated, and that there is a lot of worry about that. So, but, but does it? Let me just make sure I understand. Does it? Does it extend to some fear that that a nuclear exchange well, is possible? Yes, of course. So simply the fact that they both now got bombs, of yeah. course, you know, creates a possibility that wasn't there before. Yeah. What do they say? How do they feel about America? And, and you know, well, you know, Clinton really did well in India, you know, because it was the, a, he was very well, hugely successful was very well tour received. And, 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 and why know, is that? Well, historically, India has always felt, because India used in the past to have a close relationship with the Soviet Union, right. uh, India always felt that therefore the United States was rather cool on India and tended to, in Kissinger's phrase, tilt towards Pakistan. You know? right. And so th now, of course, that relationship with the Soviet it, Union is defunct because no Soviet Union. Um, but still, in India, there was a sort of fear that, in, that the American attitude to India was not very friendly. Yeah. You know? And Clinton did change that. I and mean, he did go there and, and, uh, and I mean, I don't, at the level of actual policy, I don't think that much was achieved. I, mean, I think he went there to, to, to worry about the nuclear deterrent. He really was warmly received. He was I mean, very the crowds received. were cheering. Yeah. There was a sense that... Yeah. And that's, I think, the first time in a very long time that, that the relationship between India and, and the United States has warmed up that much. Let's talk about Nupa Lahiri and mm -hmm. her prize. Yeah, she was a big hit out there. I mean, suddenly, <laughs> you know, suddenly every single newspaper had her, her smiling face. And you rice tea. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't, know, I don't know about that. But certainly they were very thrilled that, uh, you know, that an Indian should win the Pulitzer. Yeah. Um, Where does this tradition of literature in, the, in India come from? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ancient literatures in India. You know, I mean, not leave aside the English language. You know, but right. if you go into the languages which are really very little translated into English, the literatures of Hindi and Bengali and, and in the south of Tamil and Kannada and so on, these are really very highly developed, very classical literatures. And so there are there is a long literary tradition. Now that's in the last generation started to burst into English more and more largely because of the internationalization of life, you know, yeah. and, uh, and the way in which the kind of university class, which is really by and large where novels come yeah. from, does know and, and, and communicate in English. Yeah, but, but I'm, I can think of two, certainly first-rate women writers mm -hmm. who've gotten lots of attention. Arundhati and yeah, uh, Roy. Yeah, Arundhati Roy and, 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 uh, and, and Jhumpa Lahiri. Right. Well, they're, well, they're very different writers, yeah. and uh, Arundhati, unlike uh, Jhumpa Lahiri, is still very firmly based in India, right. whereas, whereas Jhumpa Lahiri's experience but they're both is... Very Smart, attractive yes. young women. They're indeed, you know. yeah, and write very well. How and, about uh, film business? We always thought of India as having a very strong cinema tradition. Yeah, well, it's still got the, the so-called Bollywood, you know, the Bombay, yeah, the, the Bombay, Bombay talkies. Bombay, right. um, well, that's still churning out, you know, huge, great, um, vulgar blockbuster movies. Yeah, right. 
the, the kind of higher brow cinema in India is not having such a great moment right now. I mean, you know, since the great days of Minal Sen and Satyajit Ray and yeah, right, right, so on and so right. on, there really is sort of that has been lost. Or, it's not or been lost, lost completely. Its momentum it's just, or something. Just, yeah, it has lost some momentum. I think you know, the, uh, and uh, and what has developed, of course, is television. Um, which has exploded in India, really. In, I mean, even in the 12 years that I've not been there, the, the penetration of television. You know, this television came into India very recently. I mean, there wasn't, you know, when I grew up in India, there was no television service. Yeah. You know, television arrived in the, in the late 60s um, and for a long time was confined to rich people in the cities. Now the villages all have TVs, you know, and, and you can have... Are they these, are for common viewings? You well, put them out of, outside on a Somet pole? Sometimes people will rent out, you know, one television and like 50 <laughs> yeah, people right. watch it. But it means, that f particularly when they had serializations of the Indian religious classics of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, these were getting audiences, I mean, unheard of in the West. I mean, audiences were like 400 million people, I mean, 500 million people sitting down to watch television on the set at the same time. Seen as cell phones? Uh, yes, cell phones everywhere. Absolutely, yeah. cell phones in Hindi everywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the big discoveries, it used to be really difficult in India to make phone calls. I mean, really difficult. Um, now, everywhere you go, I mean, apart from cell phones, there are these little booths ca called public call offices where you can go in and you can make, like, metered calls mm. to anywhere in India or anywhere else in the world. Now, now, I mean, it may seem like a sort of simple, obvious thing, but what it's done in India is to destroy... If you like the loneliness of India, the isolation of India, you can be in the most remote part of the Indian village world, you know, and you'll still find a public call office. You can still call up somebody somewhere else. And that's really is a big change in the last decade. I mean, they weren't there last time I went. What do you think your son found? Well, what I was pleased is that what he found was a place that he wanted to go back to without me. Oh. You know? and, and he wanted now to... I mean, when he was a kid and I would try and teach him Hindi and Urdu, you know, my mother tongue is Urdu and Hindi is right. the kind of lingua, lingua franca in the north anyway. It was difficult because his mother tongue was not those languages. His mother tongue was English. And, and the dominance of the mother tongue and of the environment was such that I sort of failed to teach him much. And now he was sort of cross with me because I hadn't taught him properly, you know. Yeah, and, exactly. And wanted to learn it properly and wanted to go back, you know, for a longer time without dad, you know, without yeah. the circus around now, me. Are you closer to him since after his mom died? Well, we've always been very close, I mean, I'm happy to say, but yeah, I mean, his, his mother died just six months or so ago, and of course that was, a, a, she died very young, I mean, she was only 50, yeah. um, and, uh, and we had always remained very close friends, and actually, you know, we spent the last couple of days of her life by her bedside, and, and, and that was one reason I wanted to take him to India, I just felt it was time for a little father-son moment, you know, and it worked, I mean, just at that level, it worked wonderfully well, and and, uh, and we, you know, we got on fine together and had a very nice time together. You went to Delhi, didn't go to Bombay? Not this time, because as I said, I wanted to make this trip sort of crisp and right. not too long and get over this hump of the first visit. Then we can go back, you know, next time we'll go for longer. Right. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Back in a moment, stay with us.